notice there's a record uh, button at the top right hand side that indicates that the session is being recorded. I wanted to thank everybody for joining the 10th webinar of 2014 entitled California Environmental Quality Act Part 1 CEQA Basics. We encourage you to become a member of CPF and enjoy the benefits and educational discounts. Information on membership can be found on our website at CaliforniaPreservation.org. The California Preservation Foundation is a membership-based, not-for-profit organization whose mission is to provide statewide leadership in education and advocacy to ensure protection of historic resources in California. The format for today's webinar will consist of a presentation of approximately 60 to 75 minutes. We will close with a 15-minute Q&A period. There is a Q&A box on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, please type it in the box and we will hold the question until it can be addressed by a speaker. There is also a chat box which is visible to our, all participants. If you would like to comment or interject or if you have any technical issues, don't hesitate to use the chat box. If you are attached to a microphone, you should grant Adobe Connect voice access to your microphone when asked to do so. Your voice will be muted during most of the presentation, but you may raise your hand by clicking on the hand sim symbol at the top of your screen. The hand symbol can be found at the center top portion of your screen. Um, if you click on that, it alerts us that you'd like to ask a question. Once your hand is raised, we will grant you voice access at an appropriate time. If, your voice, uh, if for some reason your voice does not work, you will need to type in your question or response in the chat box. Now I'll introduce our speaker for today. Christopher McMorris is a partner and architectural historian at JRP Historical Consulting, LLC, with over 16 years of experience in the field of historic preservation and cultural resources management. Mr. McMorris holds an MS in Historic Preservation from Columbia University. His bachelor degrees are from the University of Rochester in New York. He specializes in conducting historic resource studies for compliance with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and the California Environmental Quality Act, along with other historic preservation projects. He serves as a lead historian, principal investigator, and project manager on projects for federal, state, and local government as well as for engineering and environmental consulting firms and others. Many of his projects involve survey and evaluation of historic resources under the criteria for the National Register of Historic Places and the California Register of Historical Resources, along with analysis of effects um, of projects, effects projects may have on historic properties and measures to mitigate those effects. Mr. McMorris. My apologies, Mr. McMorris is an adjunct faculty member at California State University, Sacramento's public history program where he teaches a seminar on historic preservation. He has also conducted a multiple historic resources compli compliance training seminars and made numerous conference presentations, including previous CPF events. Without further ado, we'll uh, begin the presentation, but first we'll, we will pull up a quiz. And it appears that the results indicate most people are from uh, local or state government, and uh, second most from any combination of the above. So now we are going to close the quiz and begin with Chris's presentation. Uh, you're ready to begin, Chris. All right. Well, thanks very much, John. I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me well enough. Um, I appreciate you having me, and uh, I, I thank you everybody for responding to the little uh, little poll there. Uh, I wanted to have a sense of uh, who who was going to be on the on the the call today. 
the presentation uh, what I tried to do here to put together this presentation was pretty much as 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 uh, was CPF had advertised it so what I'm gonna do here is uh, go over so just provide an overview of SQL and to, to folks that are at city agencies this may be just sort of a review but the idea would be this provides information for folks with minimal knowledge about CEQA itself and so how uh, it, it's good to lay the groundwork of that so that we can talk about the ways in which historic resources uh, fits into that larger uh, picture. And uh, because of my area of expertise as noted in the introduction, uh, the focus today will be on built environment historic architectural resources. I do try to touch upon archaeological resources, but there are some nuances and some uh, issues that are related to archaeological resources that, well, frankly, are beyond my expertise. But I, I do try to do try to talk about those a little bit, and I know a little bit about it. So uh, if people have questions about that, we can we can chat about that as well. So first up is going to be. Um, There we go. The overview of SQL. I'm just getting my um, uh, this to to function. Hey, uh, John. Is this um, is this? Uh, I'm having a hard time getting to the next slide. We'll get through this brief technical difficulty Oop. yeah there we go all right uh, okay so CEQA is uh, the principal uh, statute mandating environmental assessment for projects in California uh, enacted in 1970 it's part of the public resources code there's the section and you hear references to the CEQA guidelines well those are the regulations that uh, uh, state and, and local agencies have to deal with to uh, to uh, conduct CEQA and the CEQA guidelines are part of the California code of federal like regulations and and CEQA is binding on both state and local agencies CEQA's overall purpose is to evaluate whether proposed projects are going to have uh, or may have a significant impact on the environment and establish whether or not those impacts can be reduced or avoided by pursuing either alternative plans or through mitigation. The photographs there at the below are the uh, Sacramento Rail Yards project which GRP was involved with some years ago. CEQA's goals are uh, fairly lofty. It's to, you know, really develop and try to maintain a high-quality environment in the state now and in the, in the future. What CEQA tries to do is ensure that California public agencies identify significant environmental effects for their actions and avoid or mitigate those effects where feasible. Now, one of the crucial initial things to know about CEQA and folks that are in public agencies, of course, are going to be aware of this, but that CEQA really applies to projects. And uh, those are actions that are undertaken or, or, or need approval from state or local public agencies. And these are actions specifically that have the potential to physically impact the environment, either directly or, or indirectly. And CEQA says that uh, those, those um, projects need to be the whole of an action. That is, that a public agency is not supposed to segment out uh, these actions or these activities. Uh, the, the danger there is that the, like a series of related activities uh, that are segmented out could be avoiding um, you know, the scrutiny that is uh, prescribed under CEQA. So CEQA's three basic questions are, okay, is this activity that this, uh, that this public agency needs to do, uh, is it a project as defined under CEQA? Now there are plenty of ways, and I'll get to these in a moment, that uh, lots of actions are actually exempt from CEQA. So is the project that, that is here, is that going to be exempt from CEQA? And if it's not exempt from CEQA, will the project have a significant effect on the environment?
Now that uh, it's very difficult to probably read this unless you're, you know, about three inches from your screen. But the um, I, I put this up. This is the the SQL process flow chart, and uh, you know, it it does show you the, the 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 general steps. So at the top is okay. Is it a project? Okay. Is it exempt? All right. Is there a possible significant effect? And I'll be talking a little bit about lead agency versus responsible agency. But lead agency is the agency that's in charge of uh, SQL compliance, uh, and they may or may not be the the agency that actually is conducting the action or the project. Responsible agency is going to be that uh, uh, agency, that public agency that's actually doing the project or giving the approval, but is not the uh, is not the SQL uh, lead. Um, the flowchart, I should say, this flowchart doesn't appear to be currently available on the resources agency website. So it, it maybe it's being revised or something, but I thought that was interesting when I went to go look for the source and make sure that this link that I had worked, and it didn't work. But uh, anyway, that's a general process um, for, for SQL, and it kind of gives you the visual sense of the way things flow from, okay, is the action a project all the way to, you know, a decision on the project by that lead agency. There are two general kinds of uh, exemptions uh, under CEQA. Those are ones that are in the actual statute, the statutory exemptions. And the other one is categorical exemptions that are the various categories, well, that are under in the guidelines that say that those kind of projects do not need to do CEQA. Uh, the biggest statutory exemption that uh, that uh, is an out is the ministerial projects, and I'll help define that in a moment, not discretionary actions. Uh, there are also uh, emergency projects, and then there are very various specific situations that are listed in the in the regulations. Uh, they include things like feasibility studies, and then there are specific sort of what I would refer to as pro-environmental -en actions like establishing timber preserves. Um, uh, other kind of things are also in there, like uh, establishing rates or tolls. Uh, the building of railroad grade separations, for instance, is another statutory exemptions. And things like minor utility alterations. And there are lots of others, but uh, those were just some examples. The categorical exemptions are these specific types that uh, of actions or projects that are assumed to have no significant impact. And those kinds of things are include minor alterations to existing facilities. Uh, there's um, uh, an exemption for the construction or conversion of small structures, uh, certain infill development that is consistent with a general plan, it's less than five acres. Those kinds of things uh, have a categorical exemption. Important for historic preservation is that uh, lead agencies uh, hopefully get the opportunity to use the categorical exemption for projects that meet the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. And I'll talk about the SOI standards a little bit more later, but uh, that is the preservation standard for uh, working with uh, historic resources and, um, and not diminishing their historic integrity. So ministerial versus discretionary, one of those key elements of uh, whether or not the action that you know of or, or are dealing with is going to be a, um, a project that requires CEQA compliance. A ministerial project uh, is an action that conforms with fixed standards uh, or objective measurements that are in the code. So this requires little or no personal judgment by a public official. And it conforms with applicable zoning and building code requirements and the like. A discretionary project uh, requires that exercise of judgment or deliberation by the public agency to, ter to determine whether or not the project approval uh, should uh, be done uh, or not, or the issue of a permit. Projects with both kinds of actions are just considered discretionary. So if there is a project, it meets the definition of a project, it is not exempt statutorily, or uh, there's a categorical exemption. Uh, it's, it's a discretionary action that the public agency needs to take. Uh, whether that's a actual uh, project that they are doing or issuing of a permit or an entitlement for a development project. 
Uh, then the next process is really the various stages. I see some of my formatting got a little messed up. Hopefully that's not <laughs> going to be throughout uh, those bullet points. So there is a, pr a set of preliminary reviews that the public agency uh, goes through to identify whether or not there is a project and whether or not there's an exemption. And then the CEQA re requires there to be a, uh, an initial study in most cases, although if the agency knows they're going to do an EIR, they can skip over that sometimes. So what the initial study does is it helps identify these potential environmental impacts. And then there are sort of three types at various levels of detail, uh, three types of environmental review documents. There is the negative declaration, and again, I'll talk about in this in a little more detail in a minute, but the negative declaration is, hey, you know, there's not going to be a significant effect on the environment. Mitigate a negative declaration, similar, saying we're not going to have an impact on the environment, but we're going to do something to either avoid or um, or mitigate uh, possible impacts. And then the, uh, the the big one is the environmental impact report, uh, which uh, takes a lot of effort and uh, a lot of public input and a study of alternatives, etc. Then the other part of CEQA environmental review, and this is broad strokes of course, is the public review and input components of it and the various steps that go into the lead agency's uh, conclusions, findings, and, uh, and decision. This page uh, uh, just has some bullet points about things to, uh, 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 issues just in general about CEQA. So CEQA is a process it really is one that emphasizes disclosure of information and analysis and assessment and and the and a review of feasible mitigation. And CEQA compliance is ensured through the judicial system. So that's case law and rulings that affect the process. There's no central enforcement or reviewing agency. And uh, important to CEQA are the areas and levels of expertise, and this comes into play, particularly when we're dealing with something like historical resources. Uh, the case law has been very precise in saying that findings must be supported, and CEQA is very uh, specific about that findings must be supported by substantial evidence, and I'll have a slide on that in a moment, too. As with any public process, timelines for review and input are very crucial and public agencies are, uh, are quite concerned about ensuring that timelines are, are kept. Impacts on the environment can include uh, direct impacts, those are sort of physical, you know, impacts, to, uh, demolition, uh, construction, those kinds of physical impacts. Indirect impacts, which are a little more, um, uh, you know, not directly going to affect like demolition, but it might be something like vib vibration or um, noise. And then there's cumulative impacts, which are ones that look at uh, projects in the past and the foreseeable future and take those together with the current project. There's also an analysis of cumulative impacts that looks at, um, in the case of historic preservation, uh, impacts to a specific uh, property type that might be affected. Photographs there at the below, the, the one on the left, uh, this is related to case law in CEQA, which I understand there's a, you know, the, the, the second part of uh, this series on, on the, the webinar series is going to be on case law. But the left there, that's the building, that's the um, um, uh, Ward's Department Store uh, building in Oakland that was subject to the, uh, the, the uh, big uh, preservation case in the 90s. And on the right there, that's the, uh, the Monterey County uh, jail where Cesar Chavez was jailed um, um, and that was subject to a case uh, more recently. So the first step of the environmental review after the preliminary review phase is this uh, initial study and the detailed information it gets put into the appendix G which is this checklist that goes into and includes cultural resources. It's at this point where the lead agency has to weigh whether or not there are uh, there's a fair argument in concluding whether or not to proceed with a uh, negative declaration or, or an EIR. And I have a slide about fair argument here in a moment too. Uh, 
So what the in initial study is intended to do is provide the focus on the potential effects uh, to be addressed in either a, say, a mitigated neg deck or uh, an EIR. An initial study is not going to be as detailed, obviously, as an EIR, and it doesn't have to consider uh, alt alternate plans or alternatives. So fair argument. Uh, it's a term that gets uh, used a lot, and it's, it can be a little confusing exactly what it is. But it pertains to whether or not uh, the, there's a requirement for the lead agency to prepare an EIR as opposed to just being able to do a uh, mitigated neg deck, for instance. An EIR is supposed to be prepared by the lead agency if it is presented with a fair argument that a project may have a significant effect on the environment. And that does not have to be um, in uh, the same level of detail uh, as the substantial evidence, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, that would need to be presented in an EIR. But the, um, the argument does need to have, well, and then I <laughs> contradict myself there uh, immediately by saying that the argument does need to be uh, based on substantial evidence in light of the whole record. Uh, it, it, there's varying levels of, and, the ca and there's case law about this, um, varying levels of uh, what that means to have a fair argument. And I would suggest that you bring that up at the, at the next uh, uh, seminar with somebody like Susan Brand Hawley, who knows very well about the, the details of fair argument. Nevertheless, at this stage when we're talking about the basics is know that the fair argument is out there and it really f it hinges on whether or not the lead agency is going to do an EIR or not. I do know that the lead agency does have discretion. Uh, CEQA does provide or the case law provides that lead agencies have the discretion not to prepare an EIR if they have what they feel is sufficient substantial evidence um, that is in contrast to the fair argument being presented to them. Now, the substantial evidence standard is the standard that's used to support the, uh, like a negative declaration, mitigated neg or deck, and or an EIR. Uh, important is what is substantial evidence. In essence, substantial evidence are uh, is uh, facts or expert opinion that is supported by facts. That is, it has to be based on there's evidence, there's there's uh, research to back up what the expert is saying. And uh, I mean, the images on the right are some uh, uh, the Sanborn map, or the the other is a. Um, uh, um, I think it's a deed. Anyway, it's trying to uh, give you images of what, might, well, of what that might be. Substantial evidence is not the following. It is not speculation of what might be a historical resource, might be an impact on the environment. It is not unsubstantiated opinion or narrative. It also, importantly, is not related to the sort of socioeconomic impacts that are not physically linked with the in uh, the environment, the physical environment. So uh, property values, I don't think, are can be considered as being part of the substantial evidence. For for example, so when a lead agency. Um, A lead agency ha uh, is going to do a negative declaration. The negative declaration in ND is where it's saying, "Look, there's not, there's no significant impact." The mitigated deck deck is when there's going to be a, um, there's possible for an impact, but it's going to be less than significant because of mitigation or revisions to the project plans. Both require a substantial evidence to to back that up. Importantly. Even at this point, mitigation cannot be deferred, and written comments are received and, and addressed in both these processes. Public hearings often will be done. Um, well, I shouldn't say often. I don't know how often they're done. But they're not required, but they are sometimes done uh, for mitigated neg decks. I think in most circumstances, a public agency is not going to do a public hearing for a negative declaration. Now, I should note there are some other um, 
efforts here that are similar to uh, the negative declaration uh, kind of processes. There's a, there's a set of streamlined reviews and frankly I don't know a whole lot about them in, in any great detail. Um, my, it, this kind of review work still would require analysis about historical resources, but there are streamlined environmental reviews that were put into place under SB 375 in 2011. Uh, this involves qualified um, or qualifying residential mixed-use projects or transit priority projects, the latter of which actually there is now an alternative review document called a Sustainable Communities Environmental Assessment. It's kind of like an initial study mitigated neg deck, but um, the, the higher level of, of thresholds of evidence. So instead of the fair argument being the threshold like it might be in an initial study, the substantial evidence standard is what we're dealing with uh, for um, that, that new kind of environmental assessment. But it's, it's very specific to those transit priority projects which meet um, very uh, somewhat narrow set of, um, of, of standards um, associated with uh, you know, transportation plans and, and general plans and the, and the like. So the, the big ticket item for CEQA is going to be the environmental impact report. So if they can't do, can't mitigate to, a, they can't know, the public, if the lead agency can't know that a um, uh, that you're going to be able to mitigate to a level that's less than significant um, and there's some reason that they they just cannot do that they go to a, a an environmental impact report let me also uh, just interrupt myself I wanted to make mention of what I mean by the lead agency the, the lead agency uh, well I sort of touched on it earlier but I wanted to make, just make sure that I'm clear about that a lead agency is that public agency that has the pr principal responsibility for um, carrying out or approving the project, but it, importantly, that's the one that has the, also the it, it carries out the CEQA compliance component of it, which is a little bit different than what might be a responsible agency, which is that public agency that might be carrying out the project, but uh, has does not uh, do the CEQA compliance. The reason we have the the different names is that in a, in a in the, the realm of, of uh, you know, city or county government or state government, there are going to be some agencies that have the expertise to carry out SQL while others uh, are, that's not really their mission. So the EIRs have um, a set of uh, steps and oh, briefly they are uh, that a public, the lead agency will send out a notice of preparation, receive public comment, possibly do a scoping meeting, then uh, move towards preparing the draft EIR. So here's a thing that um, I think folks that are not really aware of how SQL works, um, uh, I find that this is a this is news. <laughs> um, the draft document, the draft EIR, is the most important document in the process. That is the place in the actual report and the technical reports that are presented with it. That's where the analysis the important analysis is that's the moment when you get involved if you're a member of the public and want to comment that's when you uh, you you write in or send your email or go to a public meeting about it don't wait for the final well it's just the draft document I'll wait for the final one to come out that's not the way it works the draft document is the important <laughs> the important thing that's when the lead agency receives public input and comment and we'll often have public hearings about it the final EIR, the FEIR, is prepared to respond to the comments that, it, that the lead agency receives. And there's a whole series of steps that go into between there and, and the decision that the public agency needs to make. But uh, there's a monitoring, if there's a monitoring program, that needs to get adopted. And then the lead agency um, where, uh, and has to have a decision-making uh, body. Uh, in, in uh, makes that decision and that's what we call the certification. So there are various kinds of EIRs. Um, there are ones that are specific projects. They can also be done for programs or plans uh, and then there's also ones that are supplement of previous EIRs. Uh, 
EIRs, you should also be aware, can be tiered. That is, if you do a program EIR, an EIR for a, a program of activities, then can be tiered with, uh, to, say, uh, doing a later project-specific EIR or MND, say, uh, the, that will refer back to the initial, you know, sort of mothership uh, EIR, like they did here in the city of San Francisco. That's what the cover is on the right. The that's the program EIR that was done for the water system improvement project. Uh, GRP helped uh, with that as well. And then uh, to make things more complicated here in California, we also have when there's a federal uh, action, uh, a federal undertaking, uh, and that requires National Environmental Policy Act compliance and our CEQA compliance, uh, public agencies will prepare a EIR EIS or an EIR EA, this sort of combination federal CEQA document, and that can get quite complex. But uh, nevertheless, the the information um, is still uh, is still needs to include historic resources, you know, when it's applicable. EIRs, which is different than um, mitigated NEGDEX, include a reasonable range of alternatives. There's a no project alternative, and then others that meet the most basic of the objectives that would avoid or substantially lessen significant impacts. EIRs also compare the merits of alternatives. Now, there's no obligation to consider every possible alternative or alternatives that they consider to be not feasible. And also, uh, one should be uh, aware that alternatives can be analyzed in less detail than the project, or the main alternative, depending on how you think of it. So. Projects that have an impact on the environment, including the demolition of uh, historical resources, uh, that does happen. The way that happens, though, is with a statement of overriding considerations. This is when lead agencies, elected officials, approve a project that causes a, a significant unavoidable impact on the environment, and they uh, have to agree on a findings that basically lay out the benefits uh, and that they outweigh, that those benefits outweigh the significant impacts on the environment. The findings need to be a written statement that is supported by substantial evidence in the record, providing the reasons for the economic or legal or social or technological, whatever the benefits are. This is when the city council or the board of supervisors or the state agency says, well, I know we're going to have um, um, we're going to have a significant impact, but really the benefits outweigh, and uh, so that can be crucial in terms of uh, the political support that preservation uh, would have. Another important aspect of um, CEQA in general, before we go on to specifics about uh, CEQA and historic preservation, is the administrative record, and this is the record that is used uh, uh, that shows what was used in the uh, coming to those findings that the decision makers uh, agree on. And of course this is what's important in legal proceedings. There on the right are some of the uh, part of the administrative record for our work on the uh, the recent um, arena in uh, Sacramento for the new Kings the new Kings arena. Uh, some of the historic context and a historic photograph there. So the administrative record is going to include the technical studies, obviously, but also the supporting documents that are in the technical studies, as well as uh, you know, research um, stuff and also uh, communications. And that includes that can include uh, a fair bit of the email that goes back and forth about a, about a project. So CEQA and uh, historic preservation. CEQA applies to non-exempt projects that may impact historic buildings and structures and objects and sites and districts, and including archaeological resources. So uh, this sort the, the the presence of a historical resource itself does not trigger specific levels of environmental review just because there is a historical resource that a, a project might impact does not automatically require an EIR, say. 
And that building on the bottom there is in is in Auburn. It's the Tahoe Club. So in historic preservation, I really think the broad, the most broad strokes in historic preservation are, are two essential questions. And those two questions are on the screen. Those two questions are uh, laid out in the CEQA guidelines for historical resources. So first, we need to know, we need to identify what is historically or culturally significant. Not everything that old is, is significant. We need to identify what those things are. Second is, okay, now that we know what's uh, significant, what can we do about it? We need to establish what can be done to preserve historically or culturally significant resources. Before I go into detail much further about, about that, I wanted to kind of touch on the participants that, uh, that get involved with, with CEQA. I've been talking about the public agencies and the lead agencies. So public agencies, of course, are state or, or local agencies. I explained uh, what the lead agency was versus the responsible agency. And it, the lead agency is going to have a decision-making governmental body. That is a, uh, uh, often a city council or board of supervisors. Other parts of the public agencies that are often involved in preservation projects are planning departments, the Planning Commission, uh, the Historic Preservation Commission, the Landmarks Board, and other relevant agencies like a public works or a housing department. Now, uh, what I don't have on the screen there is also that some public some uh, communities are certified local governments as a CLG. Now, that's a program that OHP, the Office of Historic Preservation, the California Office the, of Historic Preservation, which is a, an office in the Resources Agency, the uh, OHP and the National Park Service, NPS, it's a program that they run that helps try to promote preservation in local planning. It helps uh, establish historic preservation commissions and also ensures that those communities maintain historic resources surveys. The advantages of a community becoming a CLG is related to funding and technical assistance as well as sort of this long-term um, benefit of having a much um, improved historic resources survey that helps support CEQA and um, also Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, then other participants uh, besides uh, the, the public agencies, and that might be a state agency like Caltrans or the Department of Water Resource or Parks and Recreation, <clears throat> then uh, say a development project you would have a project applicant and that's the project proponent that the lead agency is requiring to comply with CEQA so a developer comes in and he wants to do something and that's going to obviously require building permits entitlements etc and that's when that's that's a project that then the lead agency says ah, well that needs to comply with CEQA now both public agencies and uh, project applicants uh, often hire consultants, uh, environmental consultants. There's a whole industry. Some of the people on this line today are part of that industry. Um, and specific to historic resources, we're talking about people that are professionally qualified historians, architectural historians, historic architects, and archaeologists. And the uh, Secretary of the Interior professional qualification standards are what we're uh, are, are the level of of standards. Um, that uh, those people, those consultants, should meet in their particular area of expertise. And the area of expertise actually becomes an important thing. So um, historians and architectural historians deal with built environment re resources. Archaeologists obviously deal with prehistoric and, uh, and historic uh, archaeological uh, resources. There is some overlap when you're dealing with historic archaeological resources. And historic architects get involved with the design. Uh, they're less inclined to being an expert on dealing with actually evaluating stuff for the California Register. The other major participant, of course, is the public. And CEQA makes a big deal of, of involving the public. Uh, and uh, I know public agencies uh, go to great lengths to try to do that. And that, that can be quite challenging, of course. In terms of the CEQA uh, participants uh, for historic preservation in the public, we're talking about preservation advocates, whether or not that's, you know, that could be CPF, uh, but it's uh, often local um, interested parties. And it can be interested individuals, of course, that are interested in, in uh, development and historic preservation.
So again, there's the two steps. What is historically significant and what can be done about it? Step one is to identify historical resources under, as defined under CEQA. And historical resource is the regulatory term for those things that have historic or cultural significance. And I'll define that in a moment. So there are generic, uh, the term historic resources is a sort of generic use of the word for stuff that's old that uh, has possible significance. Historical resource uh, under the, uh, in the um, context of CEQA are those things that have regulatory, you know, standing as, uh, as historically significant resources. And then step two, what can be done? Well, you need to assess whether or not the project's going to have an impact, uh, identify avoidance and or mitigation to lessen that impact, and then uh, for the public to provide input into the decision-making process. What is historically uh, and culturally significant? A historical resource is defined in the CEQA guidelines under 15064.5 and also in the Public Resources Code. Historical resources can be buildings, structures, meaning engineering features uh, mostly, uh, objects, sites, districts, historic districts that is, and archaeological resources. On the right there, that's the uh, Eureka Inn in, in Eureka. The lead agency concludes whether or not something is a historical resource. They make a conclusion. In the most broad uh, terms, historical resources are those that are eligible, listed in or eligible for listing in the California Register of Historical Resources. And sometimes uh, those things can be listed or determined eligible by the State Historical Resources Commission. Historical resources can also include a, uh, a separate, um, and as I noted, the the California Register can include archaeological resources, but there's also a different definition of uh, archaeological resources that can be considered historical resources, and those are uh, referred to as unique archaeological resources, and I provide you the section number in the CEQA guidelines. There's a specific definition and criteria for what, what they mean by unique archaeological resources. There are also resources that are automatically listed in the California Register. Uh, resources, building structures, object sites, districts that are listed or formally determined eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places are automatically listed in the California Register. The word formally, what does that mean? That means that the, the determination has happened through another process. Most often that's the Section 106 compliance process that a federal agency has taken and evaluated a historic building, say, and uh, OE, uh, the State Historic Preservation Officer has concurred in that eligibility. It uh, can also be something that has, uh, somebody's done a National Register nomination and the, uh, the State Commission has said, yes, we determined that that's eligible for listing in the National Register. That would happen, say, if somebody was doing a tax credit project. Also, California state landmarks, um, some of them uh, uh, over number 770 are automatically listed in the California Register. Important to CEQA uh, is there also, and to local agencies in particular, are uh, some of these other definitions of what meets the standards for being a historical resource. So there can be resources that are listed in a qualified local register of historical resources by, by there being a local ordinance and a, a survey. Also, resources identified as significant in a qualified historic resource survey. This pertains to, uh, to communities, mostly I think pertains to communities that are CLGs because their survey will have been included in the State Historic Resources Inventory, prepared in accordance to the OHP procedures and, and requirements, and then OHP has, um, the Office of Historic Preservation has uh, given their, they have various significance ratings and they their categories, one being list on the National Register, five being like uh, um, locally significant and they, they there's these ranges of categories and uh, those kinds of resources are usually evaluated on the, the standard uh, evaluation form the DPR the Department of Parks and Recreation DPR 523 form please note that surveys that are more than five years old need to be updated what that means is that if you have a project you know it was part of a survey but the survey was more than five years old that property will likely need to be resurveyed 
uh, or um, that survey will need to be updated. And there's a DPR 523 form for resources that need to just simply be updated. And that could be as simple as going out and taking new photographs and saying, yep, still looks eligible. Still is eligible. Nothing's changed. Or oh gosh, you know, so much has changed. It doesn't retain integrity anymore. It's not eligible. Or the passage of time, and one understands the 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 possible significance has changed of of a resource. The California Register uh, ha, ha, its criteria are very similar to the National Registers, and uh, OHP actually gives guidance to advise the use of the National Register bulletins, um, specifically National Register Bulletin 15 for interpreting the California Register criteria. And the National Register bulletins are ones that are issued by the National Park Service and are available on the National Register's uh, website. Crucial to finding something eligible uh, as a historical resource, um, buildings, structures, objects, sites, districts, etc. They they must have not only must they have historical significance, but they also have to have historic integrity. And historic integrity is the physical features that a resource has to convey its significance. There are some differences between the National Register and California Register. Uh, there's a little bit of a difference in terms of the interpretation of way historic integrity is described. Uh, but it's still essentially the same. And then there are certain kinds of resources that uh, take special consideration, uh, what's referred to as special considerations under CEQA, under the California Register, or criteria considerations uh, under the, uh, the, the National Register. On the left there is the uh, um, Pine Street Auto uh, Row Historic District in San Francisco and the Lion Bridge, the 7th Street Bridge in Modesto. All right, so a lot of words on this page, but these are the criteria for the California Register. At first reading, if you're if you're new to reading the, the criteria, they look rather broad, um, but uh, there are standards by which they are not necessarily subjective, and they, the application of the California Register criteria, um, while it has some subjectivity at, at some point, um, is intended not to be, because resources need to be significant, uh, not just have mere association. So that's why it says resources must be significant at the state, a national, state, local uh, level. Um, and that uh, criterion one is for association with events and trends. Criteria two is with historic uh, persons. Three is for the uh, design and, and uh, construction methods. Four is for uh, important information that might be yielded. That's usually used for archaeological resources. And those line up with criteria A through D of the National Register. Integ Integrity is the same seven aspects of integrity that are for the National Register, uh, location, setting, design, materials, workmanship, association, and feeling. Uh, interesting, the, um, there are some local uh, ordinances that, uh, that lay these kinds of criteria out. Very similarly, they may be enumerated differently. Um, I thought it was interesting to find that the Sacramento's ordinance um, decided, well, well, we don't need integrity of feeling. That's too squishy, so we're not going to use that one. But uh, the, the, the Sacramento Register's criteria are pretty much line up with, with the California Register and the National Register. The, the special considerations that, um, that you need to look further at uh, these issues, the, um, they need to meet certain standards, are for buildings that, are gonna have, that were moved properties that are less than 50 years old. So there's a standard um, by which properties that have achieved significance within the past 50 years, a threshold, um, there's one for the National Register and a slightly different one for the California Register. And then there's also a special consideration for properties that have been reconstructed. Again, a lot of words on, on this page, but what this outlines is uh, reminds you back to what we talk, I talked about in the first half, which is regarding, hey, you know, we're talking about substantial evidence. That is a very crucial aspect of CEQA. And so, 
So what does that mean when we're trying to apply what's historically significant? And so this these outline for mostly the built environment, but um, it means establishing an appropriate historic context to understand the resource. That means understanding its theme, its period, its geographical limits, and then providing sufficient justification about why that resource is significant within that historic context, as well as assessing whether or not the resource has the physical features that convey its significance, i.e. historic integrity. So a resource can be hist very historically significant but lack sufficient uh, historic integrity then it's not eligible. Vice versa, something can have great historic integrity apparently, pretty much looks like it did when it was constructed, but have very little historical significance under the criteria and that too wouldn't be a historical resource. The sort of standards, there, there are no set standards under CEQA about what, uh, what re what's required, but uh, you know, trying to reach that substantial evidence standard, it's crucial that uh, sufficient research is, is going to be done. So we're talking about more than going to the record center, uh, the information centers, and getting a record search done and reviewing previous reports examining primary and secondary records in, in, the, in the library or public records, consulting interested parties, doing a site visit, taking photographs. The standard for that is preparing of the DPR 523 forms and the OHP has, uh, has um, uh, instructions for laying those out. And I, I believe, by the way, those instructions that are available on the OHP website, I believe OHP is updating those currently. So uh, they, they were published in 1995 and I think they're trying to improve them to uh, update them. I, the, <laughs> the standards um, have no idea about uh, digital photography or anything like that. So uh, we've, uh, obviously the, the industry has changed quite a bit since, since then. Also, and this is important for uh, when we get down to impacts analysis, it's important to identify what the boundaries of that historical resource is the, and what its character defining features. What are the things that make it, that, that characterize its important qualities? Uh, and that becomes into play, especially if there is something that's going to remodel a historic building. We need to know what is historically significant. You know, if we're talking about a Queen Anne house, it's the uh, decoration, the wraparound porch, the uh, the turret on the corner. If we're talking about a modernist building, what aspects of that modernist design are character defining that really, if that was altered, would reduce the integrity of, of the resource. So the impacts, the an impact assessment. So you identify when, what's historically what's uh, eligible as a as a historical resource, and then the next step is to assess whether or not uh, there are impacts. If the resource is not a historical resource, you don't need to do the impacts analysis because you don't have a historical resource, obviously. Um, impacts, the standard in, under CEQA is a substantial adverse change and what that is is that it, it's an analysis of whether or not the, there are going to be impacts to the property's historic integrity and this, the, the verbiage that they use in the CEQA guidelines is whether or not the historical resource will be materially impaired. That means is it going to be physically demolished or destroyed or altered? Is there going to be an alteration of the resource or its immediate surroundings that affect that integrity? Also when you're looking at substantial adverse change is whether or not the project is going to be built in conformance with the SOI standards for the treatment of historic properties. Typically that's the treatment of rehabilitation but there are uh, three other treatments that uh, the SOI standards have. And as I noted earlier impacts can be direct, indirect, or cumulative. Demolition or full destruction of a historical resource cannot be mitigated to a level that's less than significant and that uh, requires an EIR. The destruction of an archaeological site as I understand it does not necessarily require an EIR and, um, and frankly I don't really know a lot of detail about that. There's a measure of expertise there that archaeologists would have to advise on. So once you know that there's going to be a potential or a known impact to a historical resource, the effort that the lead agency is supposed to take is to reduce, avoid, or mitigate those impacts.
The CEQA guidelines are very specific about one thing. They say that a project that follows the SOI standards for the treatment of historic properties shall be considered mitigated to a level that's less than significant. Uh, that is, uh, I remind you, that's also one of the categorical exclusions, <laughs> uh, exemptions, excuse me. So, uh, but, you know, following the process, the CEQA guidelines does allow lead agency to get to that point saying, hey, look, uh, well, we thought we were going to have an impact here, but you know what, we're going to mitigate by uh, saying that we're going to do uh, this project and it's going to meet the SOI standards. And there's certain, you know, standards. They usually have a review process involved with that as well. It, uh, the the CEQA guidelines uh, make it clear that the lead agency is supposed to identify potentially feasible measures to mitigate significant adverse changes and that they adopt certain mitigation that needs to be fully enforceable through things like permit conditions or agreements or other ways and that those mitigations actually are going to reduce project impacts. There's also a whole uh, s uh, session for this CEQA uh, series on mitigation, but I've got some uh, uh, suggested possible mitigations up there. The, the most standard one is documentation, say, to the uh, HABS HAIR. That's the Historic American Building Survey and the Historic American Engineering Record. Those are uh, programs that the National Park Service uh, runs, and those are standard uh, documentation methodologies. Other documentations can can include uh, oral histories of either you know the residents that might have lived there or some historical person. Uh, it has to be obviously related to the to the resource and to the project impact. Uh, resources interpretation displays, signs, plaques are very often used. Educational materials that are um, you know not necessarily at the site but uh, would be deposited in uh, repositories or libraries, etc. There can be exhibits, brochures. Websites are becoming more popular as mitigation. Sometimes deconstruction of elements of a historic resource can be considered to be mitigation, though it's not a great uh, choice. Uh, and salvaging. And also the CEQA guidelines do allow for the moving of historical resource if it's put into a place that has a similar uh, setting to its historic one. The uh, uh, case law is very specific that documentation alone, the HABs documentation or historic narrative photographs, etc., uh, will not mitigate a project. They, the, the regulations say usually will not, but I think the case law is pretty uh, airtight that mid, um, uh, documentation alone will not mitigate a demolition to a level that's less than significant. So if, uh, we're, if an advocate is looking for information, they're going to want to know where is that pertinent information. And the, the, the pertinent information, by the way, the photograph on the previous page was uh, Preservation Park in Oakland, which is a series of uh, buildings that were moved out of the way when I think it was 580. Well, anyway, the adjacent freeway was, was built, and they picked up and moved and collected a whole bunch of uh, historic buildings. It's now like a, the equivalent of like an office park in old buildings. It, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasant place, and it's an interesting choice to have been made. I think it was in the 1970s. Um, but they've got, uh, I, I, they've got a plaque there to kind of um, uh, help interpret the, the site. Uh, the photographs here are the First Street Viaduct in Los Angeles over the LA River, and that was widened. Uh, those uh, uh, um, those elements on the bridge were actually removed and put back, and you can see on the the right photograph where the the widening occurred. Anyway, the the point is here is the where is that pertinent information for uh, the historical resources information? It's going to be there's a cultural resources section of the initial study or the MND. There is the cultural resources section that's published in the actual draft EIR. But if you're really looking for the detailed information, you really should be looking in the technical report. And if you're an advocate, uh, uh, you know, trying to delve into one of these EIRs and you don't see the technical report, um, I believe it is um, uh, that a public agency should uh, be able to provide you, then you might have to request it, but they should provide it. Uh, when historic preservation or historical resources of central issue, I think most lead agencies are going to go ahead and uh, make that technical report available. Also, place to look for once you've 
provided your comments on the DEIR or MND um, is also looking in the comments and responses, particularly in the uh, in an EIR section, for knowing how the, the agency is responding to comments in the final EIR. Um, it's going to be, uh, you know, if if you're in a situation where there might be a lawsuit, there might be problems with the EIR, there might be problems in the response to comments. So all of that stuff is important to look at. So these are things that I had in mind um, for folks that are kind of uh, advocating for historic preservation, but I, I suppose this is also relevant for um, the, 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 the cultural resources professionals in the group, as well as for city um, and uh, state uh, uh, professionals, um, government uh, people. Uh, advocates really need to know where the location of that pertinent information and analysis is. And it's important to know what and where the review and input opportunities are. Because remember, CEQA is intended to encourage open government and public involvement. It's, it's intended to make projects less environmentally damaged. And importantly, it's supposed to ensure that it's done on an evidentiary basis for those decisions, not, um, not on speculation or some sort of arbitrariness. That photographs of the uh, Sassoon uh, Valley Road Bridge in Solano County. The, on the right is the historic bridge, and they added a, a, a new structure on the on the left there. CEQA does have some downsides. The sort of project-specific focus of a lot of the documentation can avoid the sort of larger issues that regard the long-term outcomes for historical resources as a kind of category. Of, of resources. And of course, the in considerations discussions, projects that demolish historical resources can and do get approved. And this is where this uh, political support for historic preservation is so crucial. Uh, also, please note the uh, OHP's role, the Office of Historic Preservation, their role in CEQA is quite limited. Uh, it's a different than uh, the role they have under Section 106. Uh, they can provide comment, and there is a person, there are people at OHP that do help uh, local agencies and interested parties deal with CEQA, but it is advisory. SHPO's largest role is in the review of actions that state agencies themselves will take that affect their own historical resources. There's a part of the Public Resources Code 5024 um, that says that state agencies are supposed to have ship over review projects that are going to affect uh, their own resources that are historically significant that are um, eligible for listing in the California Register. So um, I just provide you an image there of the Crocker Art Gallery and its addition uh, that was done a few years ago here in Sacramento. So when providing input regarding historical resources, this is again sort of for the advocacy-minded uh, folks, you want to make sure that what you're looking at is the adequacy of the analysis and or the expertise. So sometimes there are folks that are presenting the analysis that really are not qualified uh, to be providing that analysis. And I don't mean to offend anybody here, but you know, uh, the uh, architectural historians and historians, they deal with the built environment. Archaeology really need to be dealing with the archaeology. And those two areas of expertise have become more and more defined and refined over, over the years. Also, make sure that the focus is on the relevant issues that decision makers are going to consider as part of, this, of their 
Um, I don't know. Did my microphone go out, John? Did my microphone just it, go on? It did, but I can hear you now. I think it's back on. Okay. So what I was saying is, please, I mean, I mean this is the last slide. Uh, I wanted to just emphasize, if you're going to advocate or provide input regarding historical resources, uh, and or if you're a public agency, um, you'll know that you can uh, look at the, these issues. There are irrelevant factors that don't play into um, uh, the, the, the decision-making process, and that's unsubstantiated opinion, economic and social effects that are not related to the physical environment. The one I can think of right off the top of my head is things like, oh, well, if they build that, that's going to reduce the values of my historic house. Well, the property values are, are, a, are an, an economic factor that's not related to the physical environment uh, as specifically. And then there's also areas where it's just sort of speculative physical changes to the environment where uh, th th there is no particular evidence saying one thing or another. So with that, that kind of ends my, uh, my that does end the presentation. And uh, again, John, I'm having a hard time getting just to the, the next slide, which just says questions and comments. So uh, I think we're getting ready here. Um, for the questions. Okay, thank you very much, Christopher. Um, and it looks like we have a few questions. Um, the first one, I'm not sure if you addressed it. I think I may have heard you address it, but just to be sure, um, somebody is asking if the EIR requires its own public hearing separate from the public hearing for approval or denial of the actual project. Uh, well, typically, um, I don't know if the CEQA, guide, the CEQA requirements um, specify uh, what the nature of public hearings is, but they're usually, uh, the ones that I'm involved with, there's been a series of public hearings for major uh, projects uh, that are prior to the approval and denial. Uh, of course, there's possibly a, a, a public input various stages of, of the process for, for an EIR, such as a scoping meeting and um, um, early on after the notice of preparation has gone out. So I think the answer is uh, yes. Okay, and uh, second you know, question is say, what perspective can you offer? Like, let me just uh, say one other thing, John, about that is that um, uh, the various commissions, like a planning commission or a preservation commission, uh, would have separate hearings about uh, particular aspects of a project. So if there are historical resources involved, often the preservation commission, landmarks board, that kind of uh, commission will have a hearing on the um, the specific uh, qualities that are um, you know relevant to the historical resources. Great, great, thank you. Um, and the second question is, uh, what perspective can you offer when it comes to thresholds of significance for things like small um, cellular antennas on streetlights or poles within historic districts? Or, um, I'm going to expand this, or um, adjacent to buildings considered historic resources? Hmm, that is a... Good question, and I don't have a whole lot of experience, um, recent experience with uh, uh, antennas on the street poles. Um, there may very well, it, it, this kind of thing may very well fit into one of the uh, exemptions, uh, but I would have to, you'd have to scour the exemptions to see whether or not that's that's true. I know that there is a um, a, a federal process uh, for dealing with uh, cell phone antennas. The FCC uh, has a Section 106 process, but that has become a very streamlined process. And while I was involved early on in the early days of uh, of those sort of co-location issues, um, that's become a very specialized area and a uh, very streamlined area. Um, so there may be overlap between Section 106 and CEQA. Um, but the thresholds for significance, I think that gets back to uh, what the historical resource 
uh, is um, whether or not the project uh, can be uh, of putting up the antennas, whether or not that project is going to be exempt. And then uh, it really gets back to, OK, well, if it can't be exempt, well, where is the, the potential for, for impact there? And there could be a sort of indirect uh, I impact, a visual sort of impact of putting up such items in a historic district that would diminish the historic integrity of the district. Uh, I just want to call your attention to the, it relates to, um, what I'm talking about relates to the way in which that district may have been uh, characterized. What does the documentation say about the district? Uh, does it talk about the overall characteristics? Does it talk about the, the setting? Uh, because uh, putting up antenna on uh, a lamppost is going to possibly affect indirectly the contributors to the historic district in terms of its setting. If the lampposts themselves are contributors to the historic district, then you're talking about possibly a direct effect on the, um, on the historical resource. So is the project exempt? What is the historical resource? And um, is, uh, is the character defining features uh, include something that's going to be uh, adversely affected or directly um, impacted here or indirectly impacted by putting up the antenna? Great. We have a, uh, another question, third question. And I think somewhere you mentioned that surveys more than five, year, uh, five years of age need to be updated. Um, the question was, is, is this anywhere in the code or is it just a guideline? Oh gosh, that's a good question too. I would check the OHP website for, for the answer to that question. Um, I, be I believe it is codified somewhere. Uh, it is in the OHP instructions. Uh, it does feel like um, I've had this question before and had to find a citation and um, and I just don't remember off the top of my head where that citation is. Um, I'm thinking, gosh, um, I think there might be something, uh, and I'd have to look it up, but I think there is something in the public resources code under 5020 or 5024 that uh, specifically talks about the, the, the quality of surveys um, that, um, that are in there. So that would be my advice is looking in the public resources code uh, under f either 5020 or 5024. Okay. Um, it looks like another question is coming in right now, but while we're waiting, we'll address a, a separate one. And I think it has to do with the eligibility of, of listings. And if it's determined eligible, does that automatically make it a historical resource or does it need to be listed before it's um, considered a historical resource? Oh, that, that's, that's, that actually is an easy question. The um, um, A resource that has been uh, determined eligible for listing in the California Register is a historical resource uh, for the purposes of CEQA. A resource that has been formally determined eligible for listing in the National Register is also a historical resource for listing, um, is also a historical resource because that's automatically listed in the California Register. So um, a resource that may have been evaluated and there is a conclusion that was it was it was found eligible for listing in the National Register. Let's say you just find an old survey form before the California Register was put into practice. Um, it, that means it has a potential to be a historical resource, but it might need to be reevaluated uh, under the California Register criteria and presumably the National Register criteria. Uh, I want to give a little bit of advice too, particularly for those folks in um, in the consulting world and local agencies. Uh, in terms of uh, completeness of uh, evaluations, uh, I suggest that you have uh, the evaluations of historical resources um, or historic resources, historic properties in your jurisdiction or in your project. Uh, evaluate them both under National Register and California Register uh, criteria. And also, if you have local register criteria, that's, that helps too. But if you do it under both National and California Register, A, it gives the, um, um, the completeness of the record uh, 
also it also allows for that evaluation to have a, a shelf life. What you don't want to have happen, and this is directed sort of more at uh, the consultants and the local agency folks or state uh, agency folks, if you have an evaluation that's just done under California Register, and you have a later project that is a section one that is a federal undertaking and a section 106 undertaking that resource is going to need to be reevaluated under uh, national register criteria uh, which seems kind of silly if you've just paid for an evaluation and only required California register uh, evaluation okay good um, and a second question or another question just came in and um, the question is if a house is 50 years or older and there is a request to demolish it um, and it's not on the resource, historic resources list, um, and the replacement project is subject to design review, would the applicant have to provide a historic evaluation? Uh, it's very likely that the, the, the lead agency should require the, um, the applicant to do a historic evaluation. Um, I, I'm not sure what the, um, I see this is a woman from the, 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 the a person, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're a man or a woman, um, from the uh, South Pasadena. Uh, I, I don't know your local ordinance, so there may be something in the local ordinance that guides whether or not you have the applicant do this or not. But in, in typical fashion, um, uh, yes, you can pass that uh, requirement on to the applicant to have the historic evaluation done. Okay, there's nothing in the local ordinance um, uh, understood. So, um, but the requirement is that um, uh, that it's a if there's a design review process, um, is it required under CEQA to have the applicant provide the historic evaluation? I am not aware that the CEQA guidelines or CEQA, the 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 the, the actual statute has any provision that requires um, uh, that ha that allows for a local agency a lead agency to require the project applicant uh, I'm not sure about that but um, it certainly is the standard practice uh, if you've got a discretionary project uh, to pass that on to the applicant to have uh, a historic evaluation done and then of course that uh, historic evaluation uh, is that uh, needs to be passed on to a person excuse me that is a qualified um, uh, architectural historian or historian uh, for for a uh, for possible historic how uh, in some cases I imagine there are city staff members that might meet those qualifications uh, I think in some some places, uh, you know, it might be that uh, the city staff uh, could do a, a quick review or an initial review to say what the potential is for it to be a historical historical resource. Okay, and and another question is coming in, and it has to do with the range of alternatives. I mean, it, um, the question is, what is a reasonable range of alternatives? How many alternatives should a project have? Where is that question? Oh, it is that showed up in the Q&A box. No, it's, it's oh, Q &A box. in the Q&A yeah. box. OK, well, anyway, range of role alternatives. Uh, that is a, a good question, too. Um, and uh, I think there's uh, probably case law on, I know there's case law on what is a, an adequate range of alternatives. Uh, you know the lead agency uh, will be looking, would be looking, and if you are the lead agency person, uh, looking at the feasibility of of those kinds of alternatives. Uh, there needs to be a, a reasonable amount of alternative that is going to reduce impacts. Uh, if we're talking about a, a, a project that is going to demolish a historical resource, uh, I would think that there would need to be. Uh, at least the assessment of an of a of a alternative, and the reason and reasons given about its feasibility, um, uh, that preserves it in some way. Um, the adequacy of that alternative might very well be part of the process that the decision makers have to go through, and and uh, and you receive public input. I know of situations where, you know. Uh, 
there's going to be basically a large bit of uh, demolition of a historical resource and the alternative was going to be okay we'll preserve a bit more of the historical resource in this case it was a historic district and um, I know that the, the the lead agency received comments saying you know from uh, preservation advocates saying well look that's not really a, a true preservation alternative uh, it's only saving a bit more of the historic district that's still a significant impact and uh, and and the uh, the EIR is concluding that um, uh, so that goes into that's going to be able to go into the decision making process I don't think that there's a decision so I'm not sure how that one plays out but the range of alternatives uh, obviously they need to be feasible uh, but there needs to be something in there that's not just a straw man that's put up um, conceivably you know um, a lead agency could get themselves in trouble if they were just sort of uh, putting up a straw man that could be knocked down. Well, look, that's uh, you know pie in the sky. We'll never be able to do that, or that doesn't meet any the uh, the alternative the um, objectives of the of the project. If the uh, if the objective of the project is to build something completely new that destroys a historical resource, so there needs to be something in in the record that uh, those were considered. Uh, what I am not sure about and this is the limits of my professional expertise speaking right now is um, how far in the process of this CEQA process such an alternative that does not meet the objectives of the project needs to be done um, but I think there needs to probably be something in the record that looks at an alternative a true historic preservation kind of alternative that at least saves part of a historical resource or mitigates it in some way but that may not end up in the full uh, the full analysis, and 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 frankly, I'm not sure where that um, where that area is, where that you know threshold is. Okay, and uh, I, as far as I can tell at this point, we don't have any further questions. Um, if anybody still has questions, um, you only have about 30 seconds here to begin asking it. Otherwise, we'll close this session with the evaluation. Um, it looks like there's one, one more, more question time. coming in. Yeah, you see that. So we'll wait a, a little while for... Um, oh, can we get a copy of the PowerPoint? Yes. Um, you should have received a link in your email this morning. Um, if you click on the link that goes to the news.californiapreservation.org address, um, there should be links to download the PowerPoint. But uh, if you can't find it for whatever reason, don't hesitate to email me, and I will, I'll send it to you. Um, so, with that being said, I think we're we're about to close here. So, um, we usually end this by doing an evaluation. I wanted to thank uh, Christopher his uh, Christopher for his time today, and I also wanted to thank all of you for uh, registering for uh, this um, webinar. Uh, this is, of course, and you probably are aware of it, but it's part of a three-part series. Um, and if you've only registered for the first session, you can now take advantage of the, you can still take advantage of the whole series, uh, which allows you to save 25% off the course fees. Um, you can learn more about the series by clicking on uh, the link above um, uh, for future workshops and webinars, and there's a listing of each uh, segment in the series. Um, I want to thank everybody again. Um, above, uh, or at the bottom of the screen, there is a link to a or a list a list of questions, a survey questions. Um, uh, please give us your feedback. Let us know how you you felt about this session. Uh, I will say that once you complete the survey, uh, please scroll to the top and click the submit response button to submit the full survey. Um, and if you have any additional comments, um, please type them in the boxes on the right, uh, short answer boxes. That allows us to improve our programs and possibly offer topics that you're interested in uh, next year. So uh, the next session will be on July 1st uh, by Deborah Rosenthal and Susan Brandt Hawley, and that would occur from noon to 1:30. Um, I wanted to thank everybody once again, and please have a great rest of the afternoon. I'll yeah, leave John? the screen up. Yes, John, hold on a second. Just uh, wanted to, you didn't mention the related links that's above there. Um, some of the stuff that I mentioned um, in the in the presentation, I 
there are links there to like the resources agencies, SQL website, OHP's website, Secretary of the Interior Standards. They're all there in those in that related links. You can also come visit the JRP um, the website. So, uh, John, thank you for for having me. I appreciate everybody's uh, time, and and hopefully this was informative. Thank you, Chris. And um, so, yeah, and I was just going to close and say that I'm going to shut down the audio, but the screen will remain up uh, for at least 15 minutes. So please complete the survey, and we thank you for your time today. Thanks, John.